I want you all to remember to turn your clocks ahead uh, tonight when you get home, if you haven't already, so that you don't get up too late to get to church or school or wherever you, you go tomorrow. Okay. Where are we at again, Brown? We'll have to send Francisco to the uh, ethical culturalists or somebody. And where are we at again, Brown? Right. <laughs> and where are we at again? What? Where are we at again? The Catholic Church. Anyway, the Catholic eth ethical culturalists. <laughs> We're at the College of Complexes, of course. Where is your Pope, they Francisco? Your soul, but All they right. Your ass. Uh, anyhow, tonight we will be hearing uh, from uh, <laughs> Richard Wark. And Richard will be telling us about the war on freedom. Uh, he's uh, a a retired professor from Northwestern on sociology, and uh, he's no doubt written books, and, and he'll tell us all about that when he gets a chance. Richard Wark. So, can I, during the rebuttal period, can I rebut myself? Yeah. yeah. Do whatever yeah, you want. Yeah. You can help. Yeah. The speaker gets the last word. Up, I mean, that, that's, that's exactly right. Yeah, yeah. And uh, I don't. I, I, I have a, I, I think the Buddhist concept of impermanence is quite an important one, so my ideas should not be permanent either, so I, I would be happy to rebut myself. Failing that, uh, let me spend a couple of minutes. First of all, I'd like to thank the uh, college for uh, giving, giving this opportunity. I think this is a marvelous institution. I just like the whole idea. Um, Though I am a little upset that I couldn't get financial aid for the three dollar tuition I tried. Oh, but a scholarship. Yeah. 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 Okay. We did pick up your dinner bill. Yeah. <laughs> okay, but um, so what I what I'd like to do, I would like to uh, try to make the actual presentation fairly fairly quick and leave as much time as possible for the uh, for the uh, Q and A or Q and response. I, I like the You're distinction ready? that was made between not that yes. I would necessarily answer questions, but I would respond to them in some way. And I, I talked for quite a while be, um, in my previous life, and so I've got down that standard answer, which is usually. That's a very good question, <laughs> and, and I'll look it up and get back to you. <laughs> but um, I, I, won't, I can't say that here, so I'm going to try. But anyway, seriously, I would like to spend as uh, spend as much time as possible having having us discuss this. Um, what I'm the kind of general theme the. Uh, the, the sort of general idea that I want to talk about tonight and want to advance to you is that while there's always been, and I, and I think that's true of any government, there's always tension between a government and people within the country or within whatever area is being governed who disagree. Regardless of what they say, people who get elected to office tend to feel that they know more about what's going on, that they have inside information or whatever, and as a consequence, the idea that they're, that it's not really a wonderful idea if people strongly disagree or disagree about the basics. There's always the little stuff around the edges that we can argue about and talk about, but the real 
people who have real fundamental disagreements with the direction of the government. Uh, er, uh, just a few minutes ago, the war in Vietnam was mentioned, the wars in Iraq and, and Afghanistan, and I've been around long enough that I was a extremely convinced opposer of all three of those wars. And I'm, uh, and I'm getting ready now for Iran, because it's real clear that, to me at least, that that's what's being promoted. So when you get to that kind of people, opposition to that, governments in general, governments in general tend to not be happy with opposition and tend to want, to want it to go away. However, what I would, what I really would argue is going on now is that we have something kind of beyond that. That in the last several years, and no surprise, this really dates from, from the attack of 9-11, of there has been a, a real qualitative movement towards repressing dissent and particularly towards repressing dissent that in any way can be seen as dangerous or really threatening to the overall narrative, the narrative overall which our government wants people, wants and expects uh, people to accept. Good grief. Uh, <laughs> This, this kind of seismic, uh, th this will be a test of my ability to concentrate, uh, this sort of seismic shift in, uh, in, re in how people, how the government responds to criticism has really one central kind of characteristic, and I'm going to try to show tonight where that characteristic keeps popping up in different examples of, of, government, uh, of government repression of this. And that is uh, the, idea, the idea of terrorism. That terrorism is now being used as the kind of all-purpose explanation for why we have to not let people speak why we have to have people incarcerated for years in violation of all sorts of constitutional provisions who have object who are you know why we have uh, the whole torture argument that's been going on um, and we have you know this this is kind of culminated in a way in the in somebody in a in a uh, senator just a few days ago, conducting a filibuster for 12 or 13 hours, simply trying to get a, a nominee of, you know, for an important government post to say that, that he was opposed to, that the president did not have a right to kill American citizens on American soil without any sort of trial and not in cases where there was an immediate danger. You know, no nobody nobody was saying that if if somebody's, you know, got a got a machine gun and they come into Congress that, you know, they can't respond. That no one's arguing that. But, you know, so that that's kind of a long way to go. That that's a whole argument that prior to 9-11 would have been unthinkable. That that kind of argument would have just would have been absolutely unthinkable. So th that's, um, but all of this has suddenly, well, not maybe not suddenly, but really without too much delay, starting with 9-11, uh, has been acceptable. And at the same time, the repression of speech by U.S. citizens Maybe not, maybe not killing them right away, but uh, certainly the repression of speech, throwing people in jail, etc., has suddenly really been okay. That, that's been, that's been now, you know, they, they, that we are, we're really uh, do that. One very, one very clear and 
uh, example, and one of the examples that I'm going to, going to talk about a bit tonight has been the response to the Occupy movement. A couple of, of thoughts about, uh, about the Occupy movement is the first question I think needs to be asked was, why was it necessary, and I'll get into how, I'll get into the mechanism of how it, how it was repressed, but how, why was it necessary for this, this group made up of the federal government, local police departments, banks, and others' corporate interest, why was it necessary for them to repress the Occupy movement? And the answer, I think, is to this one, unlike a lot of the questions, is pretty simple. The answer is that the Occupy movement was probably one of the first left-wing kind of movements for a long time in this country that really caught on. For one thing, you, you had a real, you had all kinds of groups being part of and participating in Occupy. You had, you had obviously you had students, you had the kind of standard issue radicals, and I don't mean that insultingly because that's how a lot of people refer to me. Um, but you also, you also had even a lot of politicians started getting into it. Um, you had unions uh, getting involved. In other words, you, you, this was, I think, started to be perceived as a real danger. I was, I, my own experience of kind of enlightenment on this issue was when I was uh, walking in a rather uh, large Occupy uh, march down Michigan Avenue, down South Michigan Avenue. And I've been, I've been involved in, in anti-war stuff. Uh, I've been even less popular. I've been involved for the last several years in Palestinian solidarity. And so I'm used to not having many people who I encounter when I'm in a demonstration like me, you know, or like what I'm doing. And I'm kind of used to that. It doesn't really bother me. But, uh, you know, it, but here people kept, people, you know, people who weren't participating, people, uh, this was like five o'clock, so we're getting a lot of office workers coming out and, you know, heading for the bus or train or whatever. And we kept getting all these wonderful comments. You guys are really, you know, that really makes sense. Because people, people recognize that 1%, we're the 99%, why are we being messed over constantly by, you know, this 1% really made sense to people. So I would suggest that one of the reasons the Occupy movement really needed to be repressed was because it was really seen. It was really seen as dangerous. Okay, it was really seen as um, as something that did threaten the status quo, if you will. Okay, uh, how did this? How did this? Was this actually enacted? Well, one of the things that went on was that there were a number that Homeland Security was very, very involved in, in fighting the Occupy movement. The FBI was very, very involved. Large corporate entities, banks being the most prominent, were very involved. And these, of course, then involved local police in local, <clears throat> in local municipalities. The order then. Sorry. The, um, at the aspect of having very violent sort of responses to Occupy, which, you know, uh, probably the one that probably got the most publicity was the one in Oakland where the uh, Iraqi war veteran found out that it was more, that Oakland was more dangerous than Iraq. <laughs> and, you know, and, and was, was very bad, very severely injured. Um, but we also have the, the expulsion at Zuccotti Park in New York, on and on and on. This was, this, it is clear from a whole bunch of, um, from a whole bunch of documents that uh, people were able to get from um, 
by, with freedom of information request, that this stuff was very well planned. And that indeed, the, the, the FBI, Homeland Security, was really, really taking care of the concerns of the banks in, do, in doing this. this. This was really a big thing. Um, in a uh, really good article uh, late last year in The Guardian, Naomi Wolf did a kind of summary of the of some of the findings of the, the for, that were revealed, and there was just a huge number of of uh, these kind of groups. Many of them, which were called in one way or another, used the term terrorist. Okay, so we we had things like the uh, the. Um, Task, the t task force, so Joint Terrorism Task Force was one of the organizations that was very active in, in, the, uh, in, in countering the Occupy movement. Uh, another, another one was the Joint uh, Terror and the Domestic Terrorism Task Force. So consequently, it was very, very clear that the people participating in Occupy were what? Terrorists. You're darn right. They yeah. were terrorists. Oh, yeah, that's yeah. right. Yeah. 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 And and they uh, and and they. She goes in and uh, in the article which appeared in the Guardian. Uh, I can give anyone afterwards a reference if you wanted. But she goes into you know to where it's actually kind of funny that in some of these places where the smaller towns particularly where the you had this little groups of people trying to do occupy stuff. You know, and then they're, they're, the domestic terrorism task force right. is after these people. You know, send in, <laughs> you the, know? Send in the SWAT team. Yeah, yeah. You know, <laughs> they're meeting at the library. You know, and, and talking about stuff. Yeah. But no, they're they're gonna they're gonna get them. They're gonna get them. So, and again, I do think I do think that this this language this language of terrorism is extremely important there. Okay, another Okay, another um, area where we can see incre increased use of force and certainly the judiciary to try to squash dissent has been in the several attempts that have been made to demonize and quote terrorize legitimate protests, not even anything as as you know well coordinated as as the Occupy movement, uh, but simply um, legitimate kinds of protests. This has been particularly this has been particularly noticeable. Um, in that protest that in, in any way has involved support for Palestine or opposition to the Israeli occupation of Palestine. This has been one of the, one of the chief areas that has really been attacked. Uh, the probably the most um, chilling example has been the and has been the prosecution and particularly the way the prosecution was conducted of a of a group called the Holy Land Foundation. Okay, the the Holy Land Foundation was basically a charity which did work both a Muslim charity and of course that was probably part of the reason they were pretty easy to label as terrorists. Right. But uh, but they, they who bo help both uh, groups within the U.S. and in and within Palestine uh, during after after 9/11, the Bush administration call designated designated then this group as being a terrorist group. Now, how you do that, this, there, no one has ever been totally clear on this process. It's an executive level process. It doesn't require any kind of legislation or anything. 
But once you designate groups, uh, such in this case Hamas was, de was designated as a terrorist group, if you can show that anybody is in fact aiding them, then you can, then the charge becomes showing, giving material support to terrorism. So if you theoretically, if you give 15, if you give a dollar to a group that, to anything that ends up with this group, then you can be charged with that. In the case of the Holy Land Foundation, they really weren't even able to prove that um, any, any money had even gone to Hamas, but that didn't stop them. The first trial re was a hung jury, this, and these, these were five very respected older people within the Muslim community and who really, you know, indeed from every indication were just trying to do charitable work. In the second trial, they brought in two witnesses who were from the um, Israeli Defense Force and these witnesses testified anonymously, okay? They, they, because for their own security reasons, I guess, claimed that they had to testify anonymously. Well, as, 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 I'm, as I think many of us would see, and as uh, the attorneys, including Michael Ratner, who's a, an extremely well-known human rights lawyer, pointed out, if you have people who are testifying anonymously, or under pseudonyms, I guess they actually use pseudonyms, that means that the defense can do nothing as far as researching them, you know, doing anything. How, how can you impeach a witness if you don't even know who they are? You know, <laughs> you don't even know where they came from. And so as, as, they try, as they tried to argue, and this argument actually went to the Supreme Court, and unfortunately it was, uh, it was turned down, they tried to argue that um, this violated the constitutional provision, which gives all of us, I thought, all of us the right to confront our accuser. So if, if if I, if somebody, if somebody wants, if I go into a store and somebody in the store accuses me of trying to rob them, then eventually when we get into court, I'm going to have an opportunity to confront that accuser. And you know, that'll probably be with, I mean, I hope this all doesn't happen, but that'll probably be with, <coughs> excuse me, probably be with my lawyer quite being able to question the person in the store and who had previously previous to prior to doing that the lawyer will certainly have you know checked into this person and researched them and all that so this none of this of course could happen so the argument was made to the supreme court <coughs> pardon me that uh, this violated that constitutional provision it didn't work and at the current time these five people are serving like 30 and 40 year sentences okay uh, there there was one person in um, in this area who was uh, made it was this weird government status that it was like he was declared a terrorist he was involved in this but wasn't found guilty he was declared a terrorist and until just recently, when they finally got this changed, he could do absolutely nothing. He couldn't work because no one was allowed to give him money. So he couldn't work because he could, no one could pay him. He couldn't, he couldn't conduct, he couldn't even go to the store and buy anything. It was this, you know, just insane, insane sort of, insane sort of thing. Okay, so it seems to me that this that this example one is cre it shows the kind of willingness that we have reached as a, as a country to not pay a great deal of attention to the constitution 
particularly when that when we see terrorism coming in there. We have another sort of example of this, and that'll be the last, you know, real specific example I'll give, and that has been the number of cases, a number of cases which have come up in the last few years, including one in Chicago that just came up about two years ago, where a number of people working in the working in the in the Chicago area and I think there were some in Minneapolis as well were found themselves raided in the middle of the night by the FBI who came in and took thousands of documents just sort of at random you know they took they they took all of these they took computers um, and a lot of these people uh, are uh, were in a lot some of them were just working in anti-war areas but a lot of them a lot of them were working in specifically in the area of um, Palestine and in fact uh, in fact some of them were working with an organization that I belong that I currently belong to and work with called PSG Palestinian Solidarity Group and one of the things that I've noted, one of the things that I've noted in, uh, on my own here has been that this prosecution really had a chilling impact on people's work, people's political work. For very good reason, people were concerned and they were tending to hold back. And in fact, our organization took a real nosedive in terms of participation, okay? I'm not whining about that, but I'm simply using it as an example to show that when you have prosecutions like this, the, only tar the target is not just the people who are actively being, go you go are going after, okay? But the, the targets, the targets are also um, the targets are also all of the other folks who are involved in things and who you want to kind of cool down, who you want to create an unfriendly and unhappy atmosphere for. And so it it seems to me very clear that that's what involved there. Indeed, several of the people have not even, after two years, they haven't received their stuff back yet, and they're still uncertain as to what's going to be. No one has actually, they were called before the grand jury, everyone refused to testify before the, before the grand jury. So that, but nothing else has happened, but they haven't been told. And so people, it's like people to some degree, the people I know, describe this as kind of their life is on hold, okay, because they're now, they're, they just can't, you know, get on with their life because this is a kind of thing. Another aspect of, of this is, too, going back to the, um, going back to the uh, issue in the uh, Holy Land 5 case of the, um, of the role of the Israeli um, uh, police, um, it turns out that ever since 9/11, there has been this. There has been an increasingly strong relationship between U.S. police and Israel. Now, whether one thinks that's a good or bad thing is maybe going to depend on your attitude attitude towards it. But it clearly it it clearly brings, I think, another another factor in there. Because you have you you have a group who are involved in defining terrorism in a certain way, and 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 Israel and its supporters tend to define terrorism as pretty much any positions that any Muslims or Arabs take, and the, um, the what you know and this in this has shown uh, Max Blumenthal, who's done extensive writing on this, 
um, talks about the Israelification of the American police system. Okay, and it, it, I think yeah, I think that this really uh, really is an important factor in this. I think this helps the police in this country to see threat among between with any group for example such as the ones i'm talking about with any group that that see uh that are help, that are opposing the occupation or anything like that these groups are then seen as threatening okay um a few um a few kind of summary kind of comments and then i would like to uh, get in and discuss uh, this with you folks. Uh, first of all, let me read Naomi Klein, um, in a, in a, um, who was the one who did that kind of uh, summary work on the, um, on the Occupy movement, in a, in, in a book of, in a book of hers uh, called uh, The End of America, it's a pleasant title, The End of America, Letter of Warning to a Young Patriot. That was Naomi Wolf. Naomi Wolf. I'm sorry, did I say Klein? Yes, you did. Yeah, I tend to, I, I, I sort of confuse the two sometimes. It's, yeah, it's, it's not, it's, it's somewhat under, I will say it's somewhat understandable, but thank you. Yeah, they do, I think. Anyway, I won't get into uh, comparative work. Anyway, what Naomi Wolf, thank you, has done is she's, she came up with 10 things that you should do if you really want to have a fascist takeover of the United States, okay? She's got a list of 10 things you want to do. Number one, invoke a terrifying internal and external enemy. Well, we've certainly done that. This, this, has, been, this, this has been going on clearly even before 9-11, but it's certainly accelerated greatly uh, since then. And we have this, they're external, and anyone in the country who can be in any way be tied to them becomes the internal enemy, okay? You notice this is exactly the same thing previously that was done with communism, right? I mean, exactly. You know, this, this is... This was what, you know, folks like McCarthy were doing. Create secret prisons where torture takes place. Well, we, know, we all know that we've done that. Develop a thug caste or paramilitary force not answerable to citizens. Well, in a sense, we really have, particularly with abductions to third, where people are abducted to third countries, you know, where you have CIA funded things going on, they're not directly. Set up an internal surveillance system. Well, we know we're doing that. Uh, the, uh, the, some of the, uh, com the com we know with the computer, with the kinds of computer systems uh, that, are, uh, that are going on, we know that that, uh, that has been um, done. We've, uh, okay. Uh, let's see, so, um, harass citizens groups. Well, that's what I've been trying, mainly that's what I've been trying to talk about tonight. The point again being that you, when, you, when you harass them, you're not just attacking those, you're, you're, making, you're changing the whole atmosphere, and I'll come back to that when I, to, for my last point. Okay, engage in arbitrary detention and release. Well, now that we've established the fact that we can put people in prison without any, without trial, without any of this, I, I have to believe that arbitrary is the right term. Target key individuals. I think uh, I think this was done. Uh, it was clear has clearly been done in the uh, in some of the movement uh, movements towards. Uh, anti-war activists that I've talked about. Uh, it's, um, there have now been several of the lawyers, uh, two at least of the lawyers who were working with people at Guantanamo and other 
suspects have been themselves arrested. So these are these are certainly key people. Somebody stole it from you. What? <laughs> oh, we're look. Uh, oh. Don Davidson's looking oh, for okay. looking for his bag. I, it's okay. Well, maybe we, let's stop the whole program and let them, oh, Don oh, find his bag. No, 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 no. Okay. Control, control the press. That I think that I think is really interesting, because in effect, in effect, we really have. But the the not not in the way it's in a sense been more effective because the press has been controlled. The press has been controlled not by you know, throwing people in jail, throwing reporters and editors in jail, but it's really been self-controlled. So that you have, you have givens that if you read, if you read the establishment press, you have absolute givens for, you know, that uh, things that will never be questioned within that establishment press. The New York Times, the newspaper of record, you know, certainly, certainly when it comes to, uh, certainly when it comes to Palestine, is uh, does an incredible, incredible job. Um, I've seen studies that show uh, empirically that a that a, an Israeli a, an Israeli who is killed garners many, 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 many times the column inches in the New York Times as a Palestinian who is killed. So, you know, this is an example of that. And treat all political dissonance as traitors and finally suspend the rule of law. And I think those, both of those are things uh, that, uh, that have been done, that have clearly uh, been done. I think one of one of the issues is that in a sense we have really we have really changed our definition of what it means to be a citizen and our definition of what it really means to have democracy i think ultimately and this, this, I find this really depressing, so if someone can disprove it to me, I'd be real happy. Uh, but I think ultimately what we've done is we have gotten the idea that we simply can't afford democracy anymore. That we really can't afford the Constitution anymore. Okay? that we can go over, we can pay lip service to it, but if we have to, if we have to imprison people without a trial, if, quote, there, because if we had a trial, this would let out secrets or something, that's okay now. Because, so we can't really afford the idea of the importance of of trial by a jury of your peers. That, that suddenly now is, not, is no longer really necessary. It's, it's a luxury. It's like, you know, well, it would, it would be nice if we could have it. You know, it would be nice if I could get a new car. I'd really like to get a really nice new car. But, you know, I can't really afford it. I don't have enough money, so I won't, worry. I won't get it because it's a luxury. Now democracy is becoming, in that, in that way, in that sense of the term, democracy is becoming a luxury. And people, as long as they're told that they can only be safe, they can't be safe and really be democratic. I don't mean small d democratic. I'm not pushing the big d democratic. I'm not too crazy about either party. Uh, but, um, you know, that, that, that's okay. And I think this is, this is the direction that I think we're going in, and I frankly do find it kind of depressing. Okay, I think I'm going to, I think I'm going to stop now. I only went a little, little more than a half hour. And how do we go now?
Brown will question. We'll take questions, but uh, I have the first one if you don't mind, Brown. Do you see any hope for the United States in its continued existence, or do you see us going down a long spiral slope? being uh, taken away as the world's dominant power over the next century? Hmm. One or the other. Well, there, there are two questions there. As far as being the world's dominant power, I, I, that I, I don't really know, and it's not really, yeah, I don't see it as the primary issue, but my sense is probably it's, it, it's not going to main, be able to maintain that. My, as far as what I see with democracy and where we're going, I, I see us as any kind of a, any kind of an idea for the world, any kind of an example. That's what I do see is going away, I, um, and is and and certainly what we're doing. I mean, I don't want to get into the whole. I don't want to get into the whole thing with the uh, drones. That's another issue, but we're certainly not. In, we're not making friends all over the world with, with the drones. Robert? Yes, sir. Toward the end of your talk, you were talking about the media. Uh -huh. And you talked about how there was, you may have even used the phrase voluntary censorship. Clearly, that's what you meant. Yeah. All right. It is. And then you went on to cite as evidence of that proposition the idea that the, there was a gross disparity between the amount of coverage given to Israeli deaths versus Palestinian deaths. Yeah. Right? I'm sort of wondering what does that prove other than that, for instance, in the case of the New York Times, the New York Times probably has more Jewish readers than Arab or Muslim readers. Why would that piece of evidence support some sort of broader conclusion than what I just referred to? Well, that's certainly, I mean, that's certainly a valid alternative explanation. I think the little, let me kind of back up a little bit. I think the maybe little bit larger picture explanation would be that regardless of, of the religion or ethnicity of their readers, they're, what, what it does show is that they're not reporting a very serious series of events. They're not giving people a clear picture of what is going on. I'm not, I'm not, I'm not so much concerned about the coverage per se given, to, given to, the, to the Israelis and Palestinians. What I am concerned about is that the coverage they're giving greatly skews the image that people in this country have of what is going on in Israel and Palestine. And I think that is, I think not saying that is, let me give you another, one more example of the same thing. Okay. Um, I listened one time on, this is NPR, okay, not the New York Times. Um, and NPR usually gets, you know, criticized for being too liberal. But, okay, so this is on NPR. In fact, it was a Diane Rehm show, which I'm sure many of you are familiar with. <laughs> she, went, she was on, she had a whole show she did on the nuclear threat of Iran, okay, and the threat of, of Iran having nuclear weapons. And she had people on there talking about it. They went one hour talking about nuclear, what, what needed to be done about this nuclear threat of Iran, and why was Iran doing this, and never once mentioned the nuclear weapons that Israel had. Now clearly, if you want to understand why one possible reason why Iran would want to have nuclear weapons, it is the fact that Israel has it. It would, if we were discussing India or India, wouldn't we discuss the fact that maybe Pakistan is? Maybe I'm misunderstanding no. the point of your talk. I thought the point of your talk was to show okay. how the culture is 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 is, is tacitly encouraging persecution of dissent in the United States. These two examples that you've brought up now 
I don't see how they pertain at all to persecution of dissenters in the United States. Well, I, I think it does because one of the things that dissenters in the United States are working with it is events in other countries. But I, under, I see your point and, you know, the, I would say, though, that if you looked at the images of the Occupy movement, if you looked at the images of the Occupy movement, you found that they tended to, particularly as the movement continued, they tended to reflect the image that the opposition was trying to give of it, which was a bunch of rowdy, ill-behaved, Miserable people. That's more relevant. Okay. Next. Uh, might I ask a question myself? No. Yeah. <laughs> Just kidding, bro. That is, wouldn't it be likely that a, a Middle East correspondent uh, uh, reporting on such uh, questions uh, might be headquartered in uh, Tel Aviv or uh, Jerusalem rather than in Ramallah? or uh, some other, uh, uh, well, let's, see, let's see, the, the uh, Gaza. Gaza City? Gaza, right. Mm. Stick to the United States. Yeah, yeah, I don't, I don't want to get into this. I will say, I will, I, I, I just will very quickly say, the Guardian correspondents seem to be able to make it around the area better, but... Yeah. We'll stick to the United States. Forget States. about Al Jazeera. Oh, okay, hey, uh, all right. You said toward the end of your speech that you said we can't afford democracy now, and you feel this is more of a feeling in this country. Do you really, do you think that most Americans believe that, that the United States can no longer afford to be a democracy? I, I think, and I mean, that's, a, that's an important point. I think that... Um, a large proportion of Americans feel that <clears throat> they would rather be safe than democratic. And I feel that they, that is the reason that these, the, these kinds of, you know, uh, de Ill detentions without trial, uh, targeted assassinations, all these things, that is probably one of the reasons that they have been accepted and seem to be politically viable. I mean, candidates, you know, um, <clears throat> candidates when they're running seem do not seem to run against this with any regularity. It doesn't seem to be politically viable all right, all right. to run against it. All right, I don't know what, I mean, everybody, the word democracy is kind of fuzzy anyway. It means every, different things to different yeah. people. I mean, don't, don't, um, don't you think that it sounds like you're saying that these human rights violations mean no democracy. And don't you think it's possible to have a democratically elected government, elected by people, most of whom um, uh, would not want to give uh, civil liberties to, to people they think are terrorists? Yeah, I think, yeah, I think that, that, that's maybe what I should say is that it may be instead of democracy we should the criterion should be the constitution okay you know and as you as 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 you know the constitution for the most part is really particularly the bill of rights the the first 10 amendments that we tend to put so much store in or at least i do um, tend to basically be there for minorities in other words, majorities don't have to worry about freedom of speech. You know, the people who are in the majority sort of have freedom of speech by definition. So they're there to protect the minorities. So I would say, I would say that. I would say that we're losing those constitutional protections. Now, whether you want to say that's, I see it as kind of a part of democracy, but I under, if you're defining democracy as simply election, then then I can see that that or it might be an issue. Uh -huh. this, uh, this might sound trivial, but it's a serious question. It was, I think it was during the first week of the Occupy Wall Street movement. It was widely reported, and that weekend afterward for months, it was reported some guy shitted on a New York City police vehicle. <laughs> now, I want to know, do you happen to know if that actually happened or 
if this was just some BS story that was circulated? I really don't know. Oh. But what I do know is that in general, and this has been from, you know, even, even when I was, well, even a long time ago when I was actually doing Vietnam demonstrations, um, that if you, if you had one person going totally nuts or at, at a demonstration and doing really weird things, that was the person who was going to be in the paper the true. next day. Do you have any idea of any of this weird stuff that was reported about the Occupy movement throughout the country? Do you have any idea if any oh. of that stuff was correct information? or? I think some of it, I actually think some of it was. I don't think it was as pervasive, anywhere near as pervasive as the impression we had because of the kind of selectivity factor. But I, I think that some of it probably, and there were, there were some problems. I, I'm, I'm not even, I'm not going to deny that. Thompson? Um, I have a question about the suppression of dissent with Occupy. It seems like a lot of the focus was on the camps, on closing the camps, how the camps were were portrayed, but a lot of other people were talking about Occupy and supporting Occupy, and there's all these Occupy sub-movements. Mm -hmm. Were there examples of, the, of a suppression of dissent of things other than the camps in the Occupy New Movement? Not, not that I was able to find, no. that It seemed to be pretty well. I think those were the kind of targets of choice, because they were, they were easier to vilify. Yeah. Okay. Um, no, have I gotten anything yeah. to eat yet? Well, can I get these? Sweetheart? I'm sorry, could you... Uh, uh, you answer your question, uh, uh, okay, the fresh salmon, pork, and onion. Okay, would you like potato one, rice? Rice, please. And soup or salad? Uh, salad with so dressing. I'll tell you what, I'm going to bring you soup and fresh, too, okay? Oh, thank you. And this jolly will be beautiful. Oh, I get the minestrone, and I'd also yeah, like orange iced tea with no lemon, and a glass of ice water, please. Of course, honey. Okay. So I appreciate it. Charlie, your question. My turn? Yeah. Ah, he, Jabram yes, said it. I, in any of your research, Rich, have you come across any evidence of the existence of blacklisting? Of blacklisting, and you mean in the sense, in the kind of classic sense, the, as was done with Hollywood writers and that kind well, of thing? Well, I mean, yeah, Norman Finkelstein. Does the government maintain any list of nefarious people? <laughs> well, I, I oh, think oh, they do. Oh, duh. Yeah. <laughs> I'm going back because there was a thing in Chicago. They had a thing in front of the Boeing, and the Chicago police made a conspicuous effort to photograph everyone who was there. And they had a photograph of me handing out flyers for the college of complex. Yeah. Inviting people to. <laughs> yeah. I, I, I'm going to deny I ever met you. That's what I'm going to do. <laughs> I told you it had a chilling effect. <laughs> yeah, so who's the, who's next? And who's next? Yeah, who's the infiltrator? Uh, yeah, you mentioned that uh, Israel gets a lot more column inches of coverage than does uh, Palestinians. But um, for one thing, Israel is a viable nation. Uh, Palestine is still kind of fledgling. And uh, what's more, uh, I know that, uh, Palest that um, uh, Israel gave Palestine a, gave the Palestinians a piece of uh, land. You're welcome, sweetheart. And uh, to, as a gesture of peace. And that a week wouldn't go by when they didn't launch missiles from that piece of land at Israel. You got a question there? And this no, went no, no, on it's not. Time it's not. Until Israel went in there and took it back. When they took it back, the newspapers were all made Israel out to be the bad guy. Yeah. So I don't think Israel gets any special favorable coverage. What's your you question? question? Yeah, I, I, yeah, I'm coming if you'll listen. You've been talking. As I was saying, uh, the thing is, I think that um, I don't see how Israel is relevant to what you're talking about with respect to us losing our rights. Is there any question in all this? Is Can you reiterate on that, please? All the question? <laughs> <laughs> Dora? 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 I, I think I'll just pass. I'm, I'm not sure.
where we're going on the right. Yeah. Uh, where would you, as a fair-minded person, draw the what would seem to be the fine line between legitimate surveillance of organizations which may or may not be subversive and may or may not be found innocent after investigation, uh, and uh, where would you draw that fine line between that and out-and-out out harassment and persecution? Well, that's, a, that's a certainly a, a challenging question. Thank you. Um, I, think, I think I would draw it somewhere around the issue of is there some kind of meaningful proof that this organization, prior to this investigation, oh, thank you, sir. is, I mean, you could go out on the street and you could find somebody and you could say, they look, you look suspicious, I'm going to investigate you. Yeah. That's clearly not, I don't think that's acceptable. So you, in order to investigate them, you would have to have some reasonable reason to do that. And I think that's sort of where I draw the line. Now I know that I mean we can all we can talk forever on what is reasonable and what's not, but that's kind of where I I do it. If an organization has done something or been involved in something that would lead that le would lead a you know the a fair-minded person to think they, there might be more there, then yeah, investigate it. But otherwise, if all they've done is get involved in legal, nonviolent protest. You know, stand in front of a place with signs or whatever, or even have sit-ins, but be nonviolent. I don't think there's anything in that that should that should trigger more surveillance. Well, what if they were about to Did you have a question? We got surely we have more questions. Cubs fan or Sox fan? Cubs. Ooh, yeah. <laughs> I've always lived on the north side. I guess. <laughs> and the others. I got a question. When, do you, in your research, do you have any idea uh, run across when? The Patriot Act and the Homeland Security Act were actually written and prepared. No, I mean other than you. You mean were they prepared ahead of time? Is that what you're asking? Yeah. I, I haven't. I haven't seen anything that would indicate that. I don't necessarily deny its possibility, but I haven't seen anything that in, it would indicate that. Okay. Yes. Yeah. So could um, you could you tie in the relationship? between anti-communism and anti-terrorism and the reasons behind those types of uh, situations, that type of ideology. Anti-communism and could you, anti- Could you tie them both together? Anti-communism and anti-terrorism? Anti and give us the rationale for that. What is the reason behind it? What is the ideology? And what is the uh, game that comes out of us? I'm still, I'm a little, I'm still a little hazy on where you're going. Anti. Anti-communism and anti-terrorism. Anti yeah, the rationale behind it. Why okay. is it done? Okay. Yeah. Well, because the because this these are both perceived as threats to the both communism at one time was perceived as a threat to the country and what is being called terrorism, though it's a little different because terrorism is not an ideology. Mm. Communism is an ideology. And there were, and actually, there were actually countries that were communist. Yeah. But there is no country. No country that's exactly, thank you. On. There isn't, you know, a country that, you know, says we're, te we're terrorists, you know. Yeah, yeah, yeah. And that's one of the things that made the whole, as any number of people commented, that's one of the things that made the whole idea of a war on terror 
kind of weird because terror was a tactic, not a, not an ideology. So, but given that given that difference, the anti seems to me to be one. Both of them have used communism, the threat of communism or the threat of terrorism, to gain more power for the government and to overlook, be able to do what I was talking about earlier, which is overlook the Constitution. You know, the, you know, the, the, the idea of, of blacklisting, of, you know, that, that occurred from communism, etc. So, yeah, I think they functioned in somewhat the same way, even though they're different things. Do you see any hope in the in what you've talked about, in any hopeful signs that the U.S. might get out of this, or is it completely a, a negativistic, a deterministic way of looking at things? Do you see any signs of hope anywhere? Hmm. Well, um, I heard someone behind me just say revolution is always a surprise, and that's, <laughs> that, that might be kind of a neat way of looking at it, actually. <laughs> But I, no, I don't really, I don't, uh, right now I'm pretty pessimistic because it's hard for me to see how we're going to, I mean, I think we will eventually because everything changes and nothing is permanent, but right now I'm not seeing that too well. Uh, I remember when uh, George W. Bush was saying that all measures were on the table. Right. And, uh, <laughs> indicating that, that uh, invasions and uh, bombings and so on were a, a definite possibility. Mm -hmm. um, isn't that terrorism? Yeah, it's terrorism directed towards I mean, other countries. Uh, yeah. The, the threats of war uh, are. Uh, are terrifying. Oh, absolutely. And, uh, or of, uh, even of uh, blockades and uh, of sanctions. That uh, obviously reduce uh, populations. Yes. It's. Oh no! I turned to get out of here. Get some weight. Oh. <laughs> uh, 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 one comment, if I if I could just make kind of in response to that, um, it's interesting, and I think your 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 what you're saying really points that out. It's interesting that we we tend to look at the term terrorism as applying to non-governmental entities. Mm -hmm. That terrorists are always seen as people who are somehow opposing a government or whatever. The reality is I think that governments are perfectly capable of committing terrorist acts. Maybe, I, I mean, I, I probably think more so than non-governments. And I think they should be so labeled, actually. Hmm. All right, Charles? Yeah, now, a few years ago, it seemed to me that the Chicago police were out to arrest everyone at least one time. He was out, out marching around like a hooligan. Yeah. Is that my, because they would surround groups or police mm -hmm. and form like a line or a wall. Yeah. Is this, do you know anything about well, I, th I think this did happen some during, uh, some, during uh, the some of the Occupy things. It certainly happened um, I, and so, uh, during the uh, NATO demonstrations, okay, because there, 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 were, there were a number of arrests then. And I, I noticed when I was in, participated in the large uh, NATO, the, the biggest one, um, that uh, the there was a lot of a feeling of threat coming coming from the police during that during during those demonstrations 
uh, people were, uh, some groups, there were different police groups, some of them were, were all wearing gas masks, and, which is, you know, is a kind of terrifying kind of thing to be, to be looking at. Um, on the other hand, in the, in the kind of day-to-day -day demonstrations that I've been involved in mainly, since I've been back in Chicago. I, I lived here for a long time, then I was away, and I've been back about, what, two years? About two years. Um, and um, what I've noticed is that, in general, the police have been pretty uh, okay. You know, they'll, they're, they're, they're talking to us pretty civilly, and, you know, and saying if you, you know, stay behind this thing. And so I don't know. But uh, I did notice that kind of thing more uh, during during the uh, during the NATO. That's and I think there was a lot of pressure uh, coming from the mayor's office. Was my impression because if you if you recall, the mayor's office was talking about this terrible threat from these you know before anything was done, but the, the, these these NATO demonstrators. I know uh, we were we were in one during this uh, the Paneras up on uh, Diversity and Broadway, you know, which was way way away from any demonstrations that were going on, and they had taken away they had taken all their tables where they in their outside area away because they said that they had been ordered to do that by the head office because there was going to be all this violence going on. You know, and I mean, they're in Lakeview. I, I didn't notice much going on in Lakeview, you know. Andreas? It's been hard for me to come up with a question on this, but um, is there another way to express yourself, all right, instead of taking to the streets? What I see in in Egypt is people taking to the street. Bring salad right now, honey. What I see in the Tea Party is something entirely different and actually results. So is the only solution taking to the streets, or is there something else that we should be doing? Waking up. <laughs> Yeah, well, you know, I mean, I'm certainly open to that. It's when you're when you're out of when you really don't have, and I'm going to say out of power. I'm going to say you don't have any power, okay? And when you're taking a position where most of your elected representatives don't see it the way you do, you know, or there's active opposition, such as you know, carrying that example of the NATO demonstrations in Chicago where the city and all of its representatives were, you know, totally against there being any kind of negative response, I don't know what else you could have done. I mean, there were other things going on. I know there was a, uh, the week before NATO, there, there was a, a kind of alternative education project going, that went on, and I actually participated in that, and there were uh, classes and uh, speakers and everything and that was fine but the problem with it was that the only people who were there were the people who already agreed and so one of the reasons you I think sometimes you have to do the demonstrations is to get publicity so you can at least make an effort to get to the people who you aren't already agreeing with you yes, so put it another way could the Tea Party be an example of another tactical approach? What could I ask you? What specific? I think they. I think they. They actually did interrupt meetings a lot, and to, you know, to make their to make their points, and that they did harass candidates who didn't agree with them. So yeah, I don't think it's just totally, you know, one side or the other. Um, Certainly getting candidates who agree with you elected is always a good idea. Mm -hmm. They also have a lot more money to work with, and I think that makes it a little easier for the Tea Party, too. So you don't mention that the Tea Party received millions of dollars for these right-wingers, 
they didn't do it only by organizing, they have money. Brothers. That's what I just, and yeah. Oh, brothers, yeah. the car. Yeah, so what is the question? What's <laughs> <laughs> the rightest party, the rightest group? Well, the question, well, the answer is... One fool at a time, sir. Uh, anybody else? Uh, mm. Charles? Yeah, I was at a meeting at the Union League Club. And, uh, wow. well, the guy was speaking all of a sudden, a bunch of Occupy people, who's that governor from Wisconsin, stood up and started giving their own speech. Do you sanction that kind of hooliganism? I think without getting into particulars, I would say I think sometimes that sort of tactic is justified. Whether it's justified in this case or not, I don't know. As a follow-up to, to this. I am. As a follow-up to that question, Che Guevara in his revolutionary book, The Art of Guerrilla Warfare, mentions that in some cases uh, guerrilla war tactics are pre are are useful for the furtherance of a movement of a cause. Would you agree or disagree with that statement? And if so, why? Well, I'm, if you mean by guerrilla war tactics, actual violent attacks on people, I, I would have to say at this point, no, I don't agree with that. Mm. If you're talking about actual okay. violence. No. Is there a point, though, that when it becomes justifiable? Anything will become justifiable at some point. What's the point of the question? Okay. One fool at a time. <laughs> if you need, if you don't need, if you don't want to answer that. No, I, I, I think there is a point. I think certainly, I think there's a point at which, if people are oppressed, that it becomes essentially self-defense, and I think at that point it does. I'm, I don't favor violence, but I, I'm not, I'm not a purist, and I would not, you know, deny self-defense. Slippery slope. <laughs> If I see no further questions, we are going to move to no the rebuttal period. Let's thank our speaker one All more right. time. Thank you. Right. Now, how many of us, I see a couple of us uh, over here, uh, have re remarks to be made to the rest of us? One, two, Four, five, six, seven, eight, nine. Right. Uh, all right. About uh, five minutes, Brom. Five minutes at least. Five minutes each. Now, are you keeping time? Because I, 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 I can keep time. Yes. All right. Our first will be. Hi. Um, I'd like to begin without a digression. Uh, I came here tonight expecting a conversation about the United States. I was not uh, uh, prepared to correct the standard half-truths and misunderstandings about the Middle East. Um, the, the speaker had most of his facts right and his conclusion is exactly backwards. Uh, he opened up using the expression seismic shift. Well, no, the situation is business as usual. It's been this way for a couple of hundred years. Uh, when the Constitution was written, uh, one of the fundamental issues was how much and how powerful centralized government to have. Uh, one of the people in favor was Alexander Hamilton, and when uh, George Washington uh, made him, I believe it was Secretary of Treasury, he deliberately provoked the Whiskey Rebellion in order to send in the U.S. Army to establish the supremacy of the federal government. Um, the, the, uh, the current excuse is, but terrorism. Well, before that it was, but communism. And before that, it was, but unions. And before that, or roughly overlapping, it was, but anarchists. Um, 
in uh, uh, after the Haymarket bombing in Chicago, uh, when when eight people were on trial for their lives, the prosecutor told the jury, of course the jury was selected by the prosecution, but that's something else. The prosecutor told the jury in so many words, we have no evidence that these men are connected to this act. But they talk about that kind of thing, so we should kill them just to make an example of them. And five of the eight were sentenced to death. Um, we, we found out uh, recently that uh, in, in response to Occupy, the FBI was taking orders from the banks. Well, um, there was a running joke in the 1950s that the, the U.S. Communist Party would have been bankrupt if not for the FBI because the FBI moles in the CPUSA were the only people who could actually pay dues. Um, <laughs> and, and, um, during the Pullman strike, again here in Chicago in 1893, George Pullman called out the U.S. Army. Not the President of the United States, not the Secretary of War, not the Governor of Illinois, certainly not Governor Altgeld. George Pullman called out the U.S. Army. Now, mind you, that was during the period when Mr. Pinkerton had more troops under his command than there were in the Army. During the Homestead strike in Pittsburgh, when the strikers occupied the Homestead Steelworks, the Pinkertons attempted an amphibious landing to take back the works and were fought off. Class warfare is not a not simply a metaphor. Um, the 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 massacre. Well, again, in Chicago, you had the Republic Steel massacre in 1936. Uh, Chicago was the center of, of the first national strike, the railroad strike of 1877, um, I, with shootings hither and yon. Again, what's going on today is a mild example of business as usual. Uh, simply because, and, and I, in my opinion, it's mild because they have less to worry about. They will suppress as strongly as they need to, but right now they, they don't need to very strongly. Um, in uh, uh, World War I, there were lynchings, um, uh, 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 that, uh, was, uh, hot dogs became hot dogs in World War I because Frankfurter is a German word. Um, people were jailed right and left for sedition in 1920. Eugene Debs was still in the federal penitentiary on a charge of sedition for having opposed United States entry into World War I, and while he was in Leavenworth, he got nearly a million votes for president, and the population of the country was one-third of what it is today. Um, in high school, they told you that when Mark Twain got to be an old man, he got sour and cranky. In fact, when he, uh, uh, he was very engaged politically. And at the turn of the last century, when the United States was committing atrocities in the Philippines, which are just the same as the ones that were repeated in Vietnam, Twain was outspoken in opposing. And um, as you would expect, got an extremely mixed reception. Uh, I've, I've got a, all, all kinds of, of examples. Uh, one of my, my per personal favorites, uh, the, the Wobblies were suppressed with mass arrests and murder. Uh, the most famous was the judicial murder of Joe Hill. Um, and Joe Hill uh, requested that he be cremated and that his ashes be divided up and scattered at least a little bit in every state except Utah because that was where they killed him and he said he wouldn't be caught dead in Utah. Uh, around 1990, just a few years ago, within the memory of most of the people here, somebody was going through some really old files in Washington and discovered a piece of mail which had been stolen out of the mail containing one of the little packets of Joe Hill's ashes was still on file in the government files. Um, no, there's nothing new about this. Excellent uh, yeah, well review of, of history and what uh, what we're up against. Uh, I have a few personal uh, observations. Uh, first of all, I remember very clearly uh, Richard Nixon's silent majority, which classified everyone else except those who agreed with him as radicals. And uh, fortunately, I was one of those radicals. In fact, I was arrested 
during a demonstration downtown uh, against the Vietnam War. Uh, and I, I gained something from it. It was really amazing. Uh, they arrested uh, a large number of us. They took 200 of us and put us in a cell in, uh, Cook, in Cook County Jail over on uh, uh, California, 26th Street. And about, uh, oh, maybe a half hour after we were there, a fellow comes along and he points to me and he says, you come with me. And uh, he took me into a small laboratory. He identified himself as a physician and gave me five minutes of instruction in how to take blood from my fellow prisoners, phlebotomist, right? And then he left. So it, the first 50 of my fellow protesters really suffered, but then I got the hang of it. So. <laughs> um, as far as the Constitution is concerned, I mentioned this many times before. My great, 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 great grandfather was John Marshall, the second Chief Justice of the Supreme Court. Um, he was appointed by John Adams as the uh, uh, Chief Justice uh, because there was a problem at the time. The big landowners in the, the new United States were concerned that legislation would be passed and signed by the president, which was not in their interest. And uh, uh, my ancestor had this perfect solution for it, and he told this to John Adams, who then appointed him to the Supreme Court. By the way, John Marshall had six weeks of instruction in the law before he was appointed. Uh, but he said to Adams, I will declare unconstitutional any law that is passed by the House of Representatives, the Senate, which was appointed by governors at the time, and the, signed by the President, which is not in the interest of the large landowners. And he declared unconstitutional 44 perfectly valid laws, which in, respect, in, in retrospect now we concede. Uh, so the Supreme Court is not the final arbiter. It is one person in there who does that. Um, sometimes in the uh, idea of the, the, uh, the freedom of the press and the uh, ability of the press to, to, to give us information uh, that is pertinent to what, uh, what's going on. Um, if you watch on television the uh, foreign news, uh, Al Jazeera, uh, Deutsche Welle's uh, uh, journal from Germany, and the BBC, BBC is not a reliable source of real information because there's a committee uh, that vets the news uh, coming from the BBC so it corresponds to what we hear in the United States. But the, the, uh, the journal, Deutsche Welle, uh, is, is a really good uh, source of news and they love to criticize the United States, politely of course, and they, they really give uh, an inside view. Um, Al Jazeera, we haven't heard much of yet, but it's hard to find. Um, yes, sir. Can I show you sir? Surveillance. <laughs> uh, in the mid-1970s, mid I found myself unemployed, went to the unemployment office, and uh, there were a line, the, the line stretched three abreast around the block, and uh, the, the, the uh, Bureau of Employment Security, I love that name, uh, was pretty well unorganized at the time. It wasn't very efficient. And uh, when you finally got to the door and got into the unemployment office and signed up, uh, you would wait, wait sometimes six or seven weeks to get your first check. That was bad. So I began organizing uh, the people in the line and uh, around me. And when a group of us, there were about 15 of us, got to the door. We all rushed in and went directly to the manager's office and demanded that the checks be issued the next day. And I did that. We used to report every week at that time. And uh, the third time I did that with the group, uh, the office manager was waiting outside the door when I got there. And she said to me, you come with me. <laughs> and she then offered me a job as an unemployment judge, and if I didn't take it, I would be disqualified from unemployment compensation. <laughs> yeah, I took the job. Also, at that time, in the 70s, although there was no external threat 
from any foreign uh, government or terrorist group. Um, the, the Chicago uh, Police Department had the Red Squad. You may remember yeah. the Red Squad. Well, they came out to the unemployment office where we were, and uh, they would film us, t telling us that they were TV reporters. And I mean, you can tell a cop from a TV reporter anytime. And uh, they would carefully film everyone who was protesting or talking against the, uh, the system. And then they would get in their unmarked car and drive away. And uh, uh, Richard, I want to thank you very much for your presentation. I enjoyed it. Um, all empires have to expand. If they don't expand, they die. The United States started as an empire in 1898 with the Spanish-American War. It used as a rationale at that time to free the Philippines, to free Cuba, to free Hawaii, to free Puerto Rico from the Spanish yoke. And that's how it started out as an empire. After that, right after the Second World War and before the Second World War, we also had a rationale for expanding the empire. What was it? Anti-communism. Under the rubric of anti-communism, the United States stepped into lots of, lots of different countries. Like Greece, we had the, the uh, Truman Doctrine in which we uh, tried to stop a revolution that was going on in Greece. And we installed the, the junta in Greece. We also installed a lot of dictators throughout Latin America, like in Chile, Guatemala, uh, Nicaragua, you can name them. The United States has attacked, either through surrogates or through its own military, about a hundred different countries in the 20th century under the rubric and the rationale of anti-communism. So what has happened now, of course, the so-called communist empire disintegrated and they had to have some other rationale in order to expand. What's the rationale? Anti-terrorism. Where is it happening? In the Middle East. Where is most of the oil of the world? In the Middle East. Of course, there's other countries, like in Latin America and Africa, well, there's also there's a lot of oil. But why do we support Israel? We use Israel as a base in the Middle East to take the oil sources of the Middle East, like in Saudi Arabia, Arabia and these other countries. So that's why we're so intent on, 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 on controlling the oil in the Middle East. Now, if somebody controls the oil of the world, they also control the whole world. They could dominate the world. So that is one of the biggest reasons why we're in the Middle East. As far as Occupy is concerned, Occupy put its finger at the heart of the matter. Who controls the United States? The oligarchy of the United States, basically located in Wall Street. That's why it's so much against them. And that's why it's out to suppress them because they don't want the other people in the United States to learn who really controls the United States. We call ourselves a democracy, but is it a democracy? It's actually, and we have two parties. It's actually a duopoly. We have Republican Party and the Democratic Party. You have the good cops, which are the Democratic Party, and you have the bad cops, the Republican Party. But cops are there for one reason, to suppress people and to render them useless so they don't try to go against the system.
I can give my speech in about two minutes because Sid is taking my stuff away. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, when, when I was uh, uh, the first speaker, I want to congratulate him with the good uh, uh, sharing of history with us and also highlighting the fact that <laughs> this ain't new when it comes to our government or any government. A government is in place to be taken over by the people that can take it over. And when they take it over, they take it over for their use, not our use. When I was a kid and coming up, the communists was coming. The Russians was coming. The Russians was coming. In fact, they were so uh, 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 insistent that people had whole dirt in the ground where they lived, where they could go out back and go in the ground when the Russian coming. You had public uh, uh, bunkers, public bunkers that you could go to in, for safety when the Russians come. Uh, now, the subway, you uh, used to have a said, you could use it for a bunker back in the 50s. You could use it for a bunker. <laughs> now, now, guess what? Subways got steel doors with locks. Now guess who those locks for? Uh, for us. For us. I remember when I was working, the shotgun that the police was carrying had to be taken out the front. It used to sit right up in the front of the car. And they taken it out because they didn't want to excite the public. They want to be soft when it comes to the public. And they want to be uh, respected and uh, 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 in, in good grace with the public. But now, guess what? A police look like a goddamn soldier. <laughs> well, I'm too serious. When they, they had to march on Michigan, they, they locked up all them people, and, and all of them got, got free and so forth. They was dressed like soldiers. Right. And they got weapons, man, this long, that looked like some people's over in Iraq somewhere. Yeah. Now, I don't know how much evidence do we need to realize that we don't have a government. The government been taken over, like Sid said, by the banksters. Uh, some people used to call them bankers. I call somebody else called them banksters. So I like to call them banksters. Now they can have me. I got to give my passport to the travel agent when I'm buying a ticket, a plane to somewhere else. My travel. <coughs> When I got a car, the guy said, I'm sorry, you have to fill this out. I said, what the? He said, that's for Homeland Security. And when the courts had changed and pay a bill, and it was over $1,000, she said, oh, you got to give me your identification. Jesus Christ, I'm saying. They can keep up with 10, 300 million people that, that, that ain't no threat in the sense of this so-called terrorism. And, and by the way, that terrorism and that communism is just words. And you do that to keep the people under your control uh, 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 frightened. And that's on how you control the masses. You, you, you scare them to death, you keep them ignorant, and you promise them things that you can't deliver. And you won't deliver because so much, it only takes so much to go around. And the people that owns the government need everything you need, no, don't need, but they want everything you got. And they so greedy, they want everything. I mean, they ain't gonna take 200 million, ain't good enough. They need 300 million, cause they got the, 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 the 300 million only is their bonus. And they need some more money for, for the do business, for the good of the country and the good of us. Well, give me a break, please. You can catch every low life, every little person doing all kinds of things, but you can't find nobody, banksters, Wall Street, doing shit. They done brought the whole world to their knees financially. Go over and ask Greece. Go over and Italy somewhere and ask them people. Even here, they done brought us to our knees. Even governors crying. Even businesses uh, uh, ain't hiding as many people. All kinds of problems that didn't happen because of the few. See it called an oligarchy. I called it a takeover. I threw my, 
not threw my voters' reservation card away seven years ago. I said, if I want to be part of a joke, I go down to Second City. I'm not going to participate in no game like this. It's ridiculous. When I can vote for the guy at uh, uh, Goldman Sachs, if I can vote for the guy over at uh, 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 Morgan Chase, when I can vote for the folks that run the world, and especially the one that run the country, I'm going to go and get my red ration card back. Until then, I'm not going to be part of a joke. And I'll ask you all and tell your friends, when you stop being part of the joke, their eyes going to get big and say, oh, they done woke up. Give me another 10. Let's go. <laughs> Let's thank our speaker again. I got here early tonight. Let's see here. I'm going to be eclectic as usual. Uh, right after the at time, the passage of this uh, Patriot Act, a number of us in Chicago got together and formed the... We still have a Yahoo group if you want to get on it the Chicago Coalition for Civil Liberties and Rights, CCCLR. And we had certain concerns because everyone in this organization had been investigated or blacklisted in some fashion. We only discovered later. Uh, I was particularly involved in it because under the Patriot Act and the librarian years past, and I, as a matter of fact, I was director of circulation and the system was that under the Patriot Act, you could find out what books an individual had borrowed from the library Ooh. and targeting them, them. And I never surrendered those records. Um, nevertheless, um, if you want to get involved, see me and you can get on the Yahoo group. And we still maintain the discussion on them. Uh, the one other thing I got involved in this type of issue was I'm a federal employee and a civil service representative, but with modern technology, the government of the United States were issuing these new high tech identification cards. And I spent the better part of two to three years litigating this. Not only were they going to issue new identification cards, but they also decided to do new background investigations. Yeah. Now that means you could have been an employee for 40 some years, and conceivably, with about an hour's notice, you would be unemployed, with little or no appeal rights. And I fought that for years and years. Um, I also discovered one reason they were doing it, this is curious, I better get moving. They discovered that they did not have background checks on about 50% of the employees, which is considerably understandable because they probably had been there for 30 or 40 years, and somebody said, well, these people have been around that long, we just don't gotta keep these boxes of paper, they threw them out. But it was very, it was in a very, incredible situation here. We got some nationwide attention out of it. Uh, also, one of the things that was amazing was my I had a colleague who always called me Red Charlie and you got me and all this. And I was the one, actually, my original personnel folder, it did have a little note on that. I still remember my first year. And it said, individual has not cleared background check. And I took that, there's no one around, so I took that paper out and drew it out. <laughs> but me just getting back up to modern time, the guy kept calling me a commie, and he was the one that had to go under a new background check, and I didn't. He actually raised issues on that. Uh, quickly now, Stanfield Smith, he's going to be speaking here. My pal from uh, Southside on North Korea, his daughter was one of those that you mentioned in your speech. Yeah, they rounded up. Uh, she spoke here some time ago. Yep. Uh, if you want to get involved in the ACLU once a month, they have a volunteer night. It's not very sophisticated work. You just stuff envelopes and for membership, but they do have a presentation, an informal speaker here. 
Oh, I'm glad you mentioned Homestead. I, a year ago, our labor educators uh, academic conference, we went to Homestead and we were at that spot where that uh, situ whole situation evolved. Uh, let's see. The other thing about civil liberties, I'm just taking this case matter and attention right now, is to profile who, what employee is a potential active shooter. And one of the things, the attributes they discovered, they can target you as a potential active shooter. That's what I mean. You, what, what you were looking for just cause, you're talking there about that. One of those was that you take excessive amount of number of days off. Somehow, according to one of the documents I got from Homeland Security, this would identify you as a potential hazard to your co-workers. Or if you had complaints about your situation at home or something like that. All right, and last of all, my favorite thing, I now this high-tech thing, you got it, send in your photographs, right? The emails and things like that. So my official folder as a federal employee, and this is several years old, uh, I, I said, well, I gotta submit a photo, they told me. So I had a photo, talking about protesting, a number of years ago in which I and a number of others took the Tribune Tower in the name of the people. <laughs> That's my official photo. Okay. All right. uh, you know, Sid, uh, this, this is a pretty good presentation. It's a topic that's interested me for a long time. I just, my parents just got me that book, The End of America by Naomi Wolf, just for Christmas, and they got a book by another Naomi whose name came up, Naomi Klein, who wrote The Shock Doctrine. I'd recommend both books to everybody here. Uh, Sid was talking about the issue of, of, of empire. I would argue that the United States did not suddenly become an empire with the Spanish-American War, and that the United States, in effect, has always been an empire, and, and that, in fact, we grew out, our country grew out of another empire, the British Empire. We started out, you know, we started out as a set of British colonies, and then we declared independence, and then we started doing our own kind of imperial expansion right away. Uh, all this territory where we are here, the, the, the so-called former Northwest Territory, you, well, we didn't like to call it colonies because, you know, we had been colonies once, so we used the euphemism territories instead. But a territory is essentially the same thing as a colony. It's an area that's governed, the, the, the peop it's governed by outsiders. It's the people who live there don't have control over the government. Um, and... Uh, and, of course, you know, we, we got all this territory to the Mississippi, and then in other words, the Louisiana Purchase, uh, and, and, um, and then, of course, there was the, uh, the Purchase of Florida from Spain, and then there was the, um, the War with Mexico, in which we acquired the whole northern half of Mexico uh, through conquest, and, um, and then, of course, you know, we went on to get Alaska, we bought it from Russia, uh, and, then, and then, of course, then came the Spanish-American War, and so on and so forth. Um, now, on the question of Israel, the Yolan Pape has written a book about, um, he's an Israeli, and he's written a book about why the United States came to support Israel. And it isn't because of the oil or, 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 or that the oil in the Middle East. We support Saudi Arabia because of their oil, but not Israel. Israel hasn't got any, any oil anyhow. Um, the, it really came about because of because of lobbying and campaigning by um, by APAC, the American Israel Public, uh, what's it called, the American Israel Public Affairs Committee. Anyway, APAC started uh, lobbying back, way back in the 50s to try to get the U.S. to adopt a more favorable policy toward Israel. They've been pretty successful at that. Now, um, on the subject of empire, I mean, the United States never stopped being an empire. If anything, we're probably today more powerful than we've ever been. Um, unfortunate, and of course, controlling the Middle East is is it. it Sid pointed out very strategically useful uh, because if you can control most of the world's oil supply, you can kind of dictate terms to the whole world. Well, inevitably, there are some people who don't like being controlled by outsiders, and, and that's kind of where terrorism comes from. I mean, the French found that out in Algeria, and, and now we're finding it out ourselves. And, of course, Israel's finding it out in, uh, in the occupied territories. Um, now, and that brings us to the war on terror, which... Really, this is a euphemism because, you know, as Glenn Greenwald put it, when we use the word terrorist, we really just mean Muslims. You know, we don't mean guys like Anders Breivik, that Norwegian guy that killed all those children uh, because he was a, you know, because he was a, a right-winger. Uh, 
and it's it's terrorism. It's it's the it's the Muslims and the people that you know that, that oppose us and the people who sympathize with them, like these occupiers. They're the terrorists. See, it's it, and, and and it's and tactics are irrelevant. It's terrorism when our enemies do it, but when we do it, why well, we're defending freedom. Though that is the freedom to to the freedom to kidnap, uh, torture, rob, rape, and kill anybody you want. See, that's re that's what freedom is. Okay, now um, I would just say that Ed's. Ed, Ed Rios' example of, of, of the Tea Party is actually really uh, a good one. One might not agree with all of their politics, but um, they have been successful in getting their own people elected, including Rand Paul, uh, who just uh, concluded a filibuster on behalf of civil liberties in the United States, which is an issue that I think our speaker might uh, agree with him on. All right, now, uh, on, on the question of guerrilla war, is guerrilla war... Uh, ever a good thing. Well, I would just like to say that I believe that as long as democratic elections are possible, as long as there's a possibility that you can get your own people elected into office, there's no need for guerrilla war. But when, in my opinion, when it becomes impossible to achieve a change democratically through pe or through some kind of peaceful means, then there is no alternative to war. And, um, and that is... Uh, uh, and Wrong. that's all I got to say about that. <laughs> sir, sir, APAC was founded in 1963. Yeah. yeah. Well, okay. Look, why don't they occupy jobs? What? Why don't they occupy jobs? <laughs> I don't know. It's time to just set it. The reason I asked the question that I did earlier, uh, there is indeed a fine line between legitimate surveillance of suspicious groups or individuals uh, and intentional outright persecution. Now, I could give an example. Shortly after 9-11, there were a group of people demonstrating, which was their right, downtown, in front of the federal building, and some of the posters had pictures of Osama bin Laden as if he was, uh, you know, the second coming. Um, and, uh, okay, it would not be unreasonable to at least look into this group and see where their ideological roots are. I'm not saying you jail them. Just find out where they're coming from, where they're at, and let it go at that. On the other hand, as has happened often enough in American history, to go after certain groups, most notably labor groups, civil rights groups, etc., anti-war groups, even to this day, to go after certain groups deliberately without any real basis for suspicion, or as they call it in law enforcement, probable cause, uh, you know, that is out and out persecution, and in any country that should be considered wrong, and in most cases unnecessary. Uh, you know, if you do a cost-benefit analysis of how much it costs for the Chicago Police Department and other agencies, federal and state, to keep tabs on the anti-war groups in the 1960s, you would probably find that the money that was spent to keep surveillance on these generally pacifist groups, uh, non-violent, you would probably have found enough money to have bought at current real estate market value the whole of Vietnam. Uh, I'm being facetious, but the fact of the matter is sometimes it's more practical to simply buy the real estate rather than fight over it. We're at the point where we're going to have to come to some creative solutions about how we deal with these things. Truth of the matter is there are people out to destroy us. There are people who would dearly love to see us come to our demise and turn us all into a mess of rubble. If you doubt that, remember what happened on 9-11. And remember that it would have continued and continued and continued uh, if steps were not taken. Do I like the Patriot Act? Not particularly. I would have liked Patriot II even less. Because when you talk about <coughs> overkill, there was a provision in there which allowed the arrest and detention of anyone guilty of aiding and abetting 
an enemy of the United States or its allies, giving comfort to the enemy. Now, I don't know if a newspaper reporter who has had lunch twice with Jerry Adams and a newspaper reporter who has had lunch with Martin McGinnis, who used to be the head hitman for the Dublin area, I don't know if that makes this person a terrorist. But the fact of the matter is, under that law, I could have been picked up. Yeah, and I could have been hauled away. And the fact of the matter is, no, I was not a terrorist. I do not support terrorism. But the fact is that if you wanted to say that by doing these stories, I was giving comfort and aid to the IRA, then you're probably going to have to lock up half of the people on the south side and on the northwest side because there was, at that time, an awful lot of support for the movement there. The fact is, the government uh, is very selective in which groups it decides to persecute. Yeah. And I am not saying, I'm not, I'm, I don't even have great love or affection for uh, Occupy for this reason. They're a very secretive society. As a reporter, I covered some of Occupy's activities on the north side. And when I asked, who is the person in charge I should talk to, I got a blank stare. When I asked, what are your goals, I got a stare that made, you know, they must have thought that I came from Mars. You know, this is the same type of response that people, re reporters used to get in the 1850s when they asked the Know Nothing Party, what do you believe? I know nothing. <laughs> right. well, the fact of the matter is that what groups like Occupy and others, which in most cases have perfectly benign objectives, one of the things that they need is to hire a public relations uh, specialist. They need to know how to deal with the media because in dealing with the media effectively, you are in a position, a better position, to get your message across rather than shroud yourself in mystery. If you like mystery, if you like secrecy, you can still join the Masons. But uh, the fact of the matter is that if you're going to operate effectively in a world where most people like fairly concise answers, and frankly most of us are used to a kind of a pecking order, a hierarchical society, if you will, where you know who to talk to to get what information and to find out what they really stand for. And uh, what I think this organization you have no stands... no idea what Occupy was about, do you? I hey, have, let, let him I talk. Have, would you let me finish? That's not... What I do is, Charlie, let him talk. Charlie, we will have an ample opportunity to discuss this later, okay? <laughs> In the meantime, it's my podium for the next 30 seconds. Thank you. All right. <laughs> I'm Michael Foley. I haven't got much to say right now because I agree with the vast, vast majority of what the other speakers have said, and I'm glad that they were all here and said it. Why, thank you. I even agree with something that Pat Butler just said. He said that the, our government is very, very selective in who they decide to persecute. And he really is right. If you're a suckhole to the empire, you can do anything you want in this country. And if you stand up and say something's wrong, you're liable to go to jail the rest of your life. The American empire really is the evil empire and the United States government is a terrorist organization. The United States government actually has run, I was going to mention two Occupy movements that the United States government ran. One's called Occupy Iraq. The purpose of that was the United States government sent American soldiers to Iraq to make it a safe place for international oil companies to pump oil and ship oil out of Iraq and sell it on the world market for about 90 bucks a barrel and the people of Iraq are probably getting two or three bucks a barrel for it. Actually, they're just stealing the oil from Iraq. That's still and I'm not ragging American soldiers either. That's still a better profit margin than Walmart hey, makes. Hey, hey, one fool at a time, Tim. Yeah, Walmart. Thank you, Tim. I love you. But anyway, another Occupy movement the American government, the American Empire ran, 
U.S. government did it on behalf of the American Empire was the Occupy Afghanistan movement. Again, American soldiers were sent to Afghanistan, and again, I'm not ragging American soldiers. They were sent there supposedly to kill all the terrorists. 9-11, Bin Laden, Saddam Hussein, terrorism, Al-Qaeda, WMD! And man, we got a war. So anyway, the real reason why American soldiers were sent to Afghanistan was to make that a safe place so that the CIA could go there and steal all the heroin in Afghanistan. <laughs> Thank you. We, the people of the United States, on several occasions, we have been told the official story from our government was that we dropped bombs on weddings that were being conducted in Afghanistan and the casualty totals were unbelievable. 50 dead and 75 wounded and stuff like that. That means we dropped bombs on a big wedding and made a direct hit on a crowd of people, supposedly to kill some kind of a terrorist. That's got nothing to do with killing terrorists. That is an attack on a society. That is an attack on a culture. When a bunch of people gather together to have a wedding, Something they've been doing for centuries, and you drop bombs on them, it's got nothing to do with terrorism, except you're the terrorist. I do want to thank the speaker for coming here, but i got to take a shot at the college that he's connected to. He's supposedly connected to Northwestern University, or he's retired from Northwestern University. Northwestern University is a forward operating base of the empire. The guy who was the president of Northwestern University for about 10 years, up until a couple years ago, his name was Henry Bynan, and it said on his official biography on the Northwestern University website that the guy was a CIA agent. And the guy that's the president of the university now, I can't remember his name, but he's a guy, he's been, con he's been connected to all these, essentially, empire organizations, the World Bank or the International Monetary Fund or something like that. And he was a big shot at this organization of economic cooperation and development. It's not one of these worldwide organizations, essentially an agency of the American empire. Now, as far as our government and what Pat Butler said about persecuting who they choose, our government does not even acknowledge that we have rights. They just don't. I'll take the case of a few people. O.J. Simpson was prosecuted, and our, I know he was prosecuted by a county, a state government, the state of California, but the Los Angeles District Attorney and the Los Angeles Police Department knew that he did not kill his wife and her friend Ron Goldman. That's why they tried to frame him. They rigged evidence, they got perjurers. Pardon me. What Pardon fucking me, buddy. Did you call time for anybody else? Wait, you don't yes. like it. Wait, you don't wait. like it when I talk, do you? I don't like it when you scream through the microphone and everybody Drew Peterson, like it when you run over time. Drew Peterson has been time. prosecuted and Drew Peterson was convicted by a jury when that one person came into court and accused him of anything, or connected him to murder. And none other than Bernadine Dorn herself. I think we of Bernadine Dorn for a few things she has done, and one of them is, she showed us that we have no rights in this country. She was put in the federal penitentiary for seven months, and everybody involved, including her, agrees that her crime was, she told the grand jury that she had a right to remain silent. She said she had a right to remain silent, and she was put in the federal penitentiary for seven months for doing that. All right, thanks. All right. Yeah. All right, David. Why are you afraid of me? Hey, Jenny, wait for me. Good evening, ladies and gentlemen. Good evening, ladies and gentlemen. Uh, I'd 
like to say that from the time that I was a very, very young man, I uh, noticed that when socialist groups wanted something, if it was in their interest, they would stand on top of the Bill of Rights and scream about the Bill of Rights, the Bill of Rights, the Bill of Rights, and wrap themselves in the American flag. But if they wanted something that was contrary to the Bill of Rights, that was un-American, they conveniently wouldn't bother mentioning that. And uh, I've noticed this, for instance, we have a gun rights issue today, they don't say anything about that, because that's in our Bill of Rights. Uh, but uh, when it is does work for them, they want to wrap themselves up in the American flag to get something through that uh, they feel is in their interests. Uh, Another tactic of socialists is they'll attempt to shout you down if you're asking questions like certain ones attempted to do to me tonight, uh, or attempt to embarrass you into submission. Uh, I'd like to point out that uh, the speaker we had here last week actually might very well have uh, address this issue better than the speaker we had tonight because uh, this was supposed to be about um, uh, America. deal right here about America being uh, the war on freedom and it seems to me that the uh, speaker we had here last uh, week did a better job of doing that. The speaker we had here tonight went into a tirade about Israel and the Palestinians, which I think has very, very little, if anything, to do with uh, with our uh, America being in freedom, and there, I mean, with a war on freedom here in America. Uh, the uh, police used to be uh, uh, men of the law who would attempt to um, uh, uphold the law and protect our rights, but. Uh, the police have become revenue procurement agents for the uh, city, or the county, or the state. I believe that the courthouse uh, was once a house of justice. It has become a revenue procurement center. but. I think we still get a little bit of justice from the courthouse. However, I believe very emphatically that when we can no longer get justice from the courthouse, then the time is at hand when we should blow up the courthouse. That's all I've got to say. I, I work in one. <laughs> well, this is a um, not a simple subject. Um, on one hand, you have a country that has, as was stated, purchased Florida, the Louisiana purchase, purchased Alaska. You have um, you have a country that currently is, has enough weapons and power to, as Churchill said, bounce the bricks after the war is over. And yet that country has managed to lose the last three wars it fought or fight them to a draw. Um, the type of country that can wield that power and reach that conclusion is, um, is amazing to me. Um, you have a country that had a feminist revolution and now the kids that I see in the world don't have a big distinction between male and female and oppose that to countries where women are aborted 
or over, or ruled over. Okay, we have a country where the military is um, admitting gay people, and compare that to how gays are treated in in other societies. Um, on the other hand, and on the other side of this coin, we have a country where, like Abe Lincoln, during the Civil War, put an end to habeas corpus, started the uh, collecting income taxes, and started the draft. Okay, another one where, in this first World War, as was said, there was a, a demonization of the Germans, how in the Second World War we had the demonization of the Germans and the internment of the Japanese. Okay. Um, you have a country where, you know, as the first speaker said, a lot of the stuff that's been going on in the, in the lifetime of our, as the first commenter said, a lot of the stuff that's been going on in the lifetime of our speaker seems to be stuff that has been going on for a very long time. You know, it's, I don't know if it's human nature, but it's been going on for a really long time. Um, the point I brought up about the, um, the Tea Party is that, boy, they were effective, you know? Grassroots, they had money, all right? I'm sure they're liberal millionaires, all right? Hollywood is full of them, okay? And they're full of the other kind too, but there are liberal millionaires. But it's, I don't know, is it not poetic to win elections? Is it poetic to, you know, the way we were? <laughs> um, the interesting thing holding this here is how um, is because the description is best said by Abe Lincoln when at the end of the Gettysburg Address he said, is a nation so conceived long going to endure? Yeah. My name is Tim Bulger, and I am a proud member of the American Empire. Why do I say that? Because our empire was founded on one principle, and that was freedom of men, freedom of democracy, and frankly, when I can see our empire having a peaceful transition of power every four years or so, means something. What does it mean when America dominates the world? It means we have peace and freedom. We have freedom of trade. We have freedom of the sea lanes. We have globalization. We have a ton of good things happen around the world. And if we're not up there, I'd hate to see what it's going to be replaced with. Frankly, I'm a, I'm a registered voter. I vote every election. I like the fact that you know, a person can still run for office and still get a platform and still get support. Yes, we've had our problems, but we're a government of men. But the one thing you do have to realize is that most every major advance in the last two to three hundred years has come from our shores. Most every major advance in human liberty or freedom of freedom of the press and religion has come from somebody in America protesting. Nuclear bombs. Well, you know, Charlie, at the same time, we've also were able to get peaceful civilian usage of nuclear power, and of course it's, it's a thing called thorium power that Alvin Weinberg also brought up, which may solve our global warming problem. There's also another whole bunch of things. Remember, here in Chicago too, where as for as much as you guys don't like it, the labor movement got started. And what did it come from? Peaceful protest. What were, you know, and even here, in, in the one thing I do have to say about America is that yes, we came in, we had a racially segregated society, we had slavery. But yes, we eventually addressed the problems and solved it. We've been able, able to have 
women in government, women in power, equality of pay. We've been able to bring gays into the military. And I think, frankly, our culture still is a good one. And frankly, if I, you know, I hear all the America bashing all the time, but I'm standing up for our country. I'm standing up for our empire. And frankly, if this is the type of empire I want to see around the world, so be it. A peaceful existence. Pax Americana for all. Yay! <laughs> My name is Lee Uh I think uh, tonight's uh, uh, rubato is excellent. I, I enjoy everyone. And also today's uh, speaker. Uh, the first uh, rubato of the taught me lots of le uh, history lessons and uh, I, I didn't know much. And also the, the lesson about the Greek uh, thing. And uh, I just like to add one data point is uh, in the Eastern Asia where I, I was born in Taiwan and uh, we were told, uh, not from the official press, but uh, uh, we observed uh, where uh, American tried to control the Korea and the control the Vietnam and uh, throw out their old government and uh, then install the new government. Uh, the first uh, major impression I got uh, from, uh, to conclude that is uh, I think in the last uh, Korean uh, uh, the military uh, coup. Uh, and it was reported that uh, the head of the coup is, uh, has to get U.S. Embassy uh, okay <laughs> to do that. Sure. I, I, at that time I was really surprised, oh, U.S. does have lots of power. But uh, I think uh, that power didn't always uh, uh, success because uh, uh, the same ambassador, U.S. ambassador in Korea and in Vietnam did those coup and uh, uh, they, he eventually moved to Taiwan and uh, Taiwan was uh, a little bit nervous and uh, I think prevented another coup in Taiwan. Uh, that, but uh, those are histories. Uh, another thing is uh, from today's uh, talk, uh, yeah, I, I understand it's uh, business as usual this kind of suppression, it's uh, probably thousands of years. But uh, I think it's getting better. In the past, uh, we have suppressed by king, by emperor. Uh, since we have uh, uh, democracy, it's not completely gone, but it's better. And the people have something to say. And also with uh, all the Bill of Rights and uh, all the uh, uh, publications, media, and uh, not just uh, the, those being controlled media, but nowadays everybody can publish something online. Mm -hmm. uh, with this improvement, I think uh, the suppression of freedom is better, the injustice is still there, business as usual, but dying. Uh, I don't think it's, it will soon completely die, but uh, uh, the world is getting better. And uh, as uh, I said in the previous uh, time, uh, democracy is changed by the information in the communication, and the communication really changed the world. Uh, any injustice, unjustified events will be published and uh, then people will learn from that and uh, try to try to uh, correct that. The last one is, uh, oh, I would say democracy is the way to go. There's no other choice, no other alternatives. And uh, the way to go is to be more democratic, try to limit the the middlemen, I say, the congressmen or the elected officials, they are the middlemen now is eating us. <laughs> uh, another is, uh, I feel war on terrorism, war on something, war on drugs. People think about war as uh, to do something without thinking, 
to do something without justifying that, to do something in a hurry, to do something crazy, violence, everything becomes justifiable. So when I heard the uh, war on something, that's something uh, is usually bad. Thank you. My father had uh, the benefit of um, an education. Where he, you know, learned uh, French and German and Sp uh, uh, Latin uh, uh, as a kid. Uh, he, he traveled a bit. Uh, his uh, parents had met in Germany, uh, uh, the uh, Americans, <laughs> and uh, uh, they were well-to-do uh, and connected. Uh, uh, so he had an education, and when he uh, wrote about uh, the different empires he had visited, he said, you know, the Portuguese are, are just terrible. Uh, the Spanish aren't much better. Uh, the, uh, uh, he didn't know much about the Italians, uh, he, but uh, didn't uh, have uh, uh, well, he, the Germans were very uh, strict and oppressive. The British weren't uh, <laughs> friendly. They were arbitrary, um, and, and uh, they could be very oppressive too. Uh, and he wrote in detail uh, to us kids and my mother, uh, in his letters home uh, from uh, uh, various places around the world during World War II. Uh, he, uh, power, when you, anybody has power over other people, they usually abuse it because those people are others. And that's the terrible thing about seeing people as other instead of seeing people as something of yourself and looking, identifying with other people. So that's what Jesus talks to us about. Uh, you know, uh, what is the, the great commandment to love, Lord, and give her life with all your heart, soul, mind, and strength? And the second commandment is like it. Love your neighbor as yourself. On those two commands, hang all the law and the prophets. Well, this do and you shall live, he tells uh, people. Hey, he, that's what eternal life is all about. Being human, being caring, loving, a little generosity. Oh, um, like and the that's, Romans. <laughs> you know, when it comes uh, to uh, people's freedoms, um, capitalists see uh, freedom as the freedom of the capitalists uh, to exploit. And they do. Um, the, their freedom to own and, and control. Uh, socialists uh, think that the workers uh, should own and control. Just because somebody is a democratic socialist doesn't mean that they are necessarily nonviolent or uh, um, re 
respectful of everybody else's freedom. You got to pray for them. If you're going to build a new society, you got to you got to look to other people, look for their help. But that's why when I saw this book uh, I mentioned earlier, Occupy the Economy, Challenging Capitalism by Richard Wolff, uh, well, I heard somebody speak, uh, the, the author, I uh, heard him interviewed on uh, CNN 2, uh, I, 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 probably at some book signing or something, uh, and he was making sense. He was just talking about how, how capitalism works and how we got to our uh, present uh, depression uh, and the question of whether we're going to get out of it. Uh, he, he said that recently, uh, over the last 30 years, we haven't had, oh, my time is elapsing. So, uh, Finish your sentence. I, I recommend this. <laughs> just, just. And uh, I recommend, uh, uh, I actually recommend a prayer and <laughs> turning your clocks back uh, forward, forward. one forward. hour. Yeah. Good night. Mm -hmm. Jim, we have five minutes? Yeah. Yes. If you need, if you need, if, if, you know, I, we can go five and a half or okay. something like that. I'll, I'll try. Um, okay. I'm I'm L.P. Anderson, and uh, some of you may have heard one or two of the talks I've given here over the last five years. There's been about a dozen of them on various <laughs> subjects that are blacked out in America. My hobby is translating massive amounts of paper. <laughs> 10, 15, 20 books on a blacked out subject, we translate that mass into a one page cliff notes that somebody can read in five minutes. One of the best books you can own is a thing called Project Censored, Censored News. Every year, Sonoma State, the Mayo Clinic of Investigative Journalism publishes a book every year on, and they list the top 25 blacked out stories that would change America overnight if they were covered rather than blacked out. In 2007, an author named Phil Rockstra published an article on the internet called A Disneyland of Militant Ignorance. He said Americans live in a Disneyland of militant ignorance. And we have some of those people in the audience tonight who are incredibly informed on certain subjects. They've got all the facts right because they've been studying it uh, there's no debate on it anymore. For example, uh, most of us understand that the Catholic Church has a small problem with pedophile priests. That's no longer a debatable issue. They covered it up for decades. Most of us understand that 800 years ago they used to debate whether the earth was flat or round. The answer wasn't known yet. Today you can't debate that. Knowledge moves forward in the direction of truth. Well, as I mentioned before, uh, just sitting back listening to some of the rebuttals, we have people in this audience that are terrifyingly ignorant of basic facts that are common knowledge and other people around the world that have a media that covers it rather than the two-pronged process in America. The media will promote the myth on all channels and simultaneously black out the reality. It's a two-pronged process and that's well described in the censored news books. Uh, one of the things, one main point Americans don't understand that is common knowledge among intelligent analysts all over the world is that the Patriot Act and the Homeland Security Act were both prepared before 9-11. 9-11 was the catalyst, the event, to bulldoze our Congress into passing the Patriot Act. The Patriot Act was dumped on Congress within days after 9-11, and in 
and two senators, two Democratic senators, uh, Patrick Leahy, uh, Tom Daschle and Senator Patrick Leahy, said they wanted to read the Patriot Act. They got anthrax letters in the mail a few days later because uh, Dick Cheney didn't want them holding up the passage of the Patriot Act. It's common knowledge among analysts all over the world that the Bush-Cheney regime represented the most successful, most run, most wildly outrageous criminal enterprise that ever ran this country. For eight solid years, we had one long, large crime against humanity. But yet, the press portrayed George Bush as the president. George Bush was never the president, never duly elected. Dick Cheney was never the official vice president. They were two corporate criminals that lost both elections. They were installed with massive fraud, and those two guys masqueraded as our two elected officials for eight solid criminally corrupt, mind-numbing years. That's the reality of what happened. As I mentioned earlier, this book, Kill Anything That Moves, describes the reality on the ground of what was going on in Vietnam, and this book in the movie Avatar describe what our military-industrial complex has been doing in foreign countries for the last 40 years. American troops aren't fighting or defending American freedom anywhere on the planet. They are moving people off the land. Like in the movie Avatar, Jake holds up, a Marine holds up a book and he said, she wrote the book on it. This is how they do it. You find out where the rare resources are that some corporation wants. You find out who's living over that land. You declare them the enemy and send the Marines in to wipe them out. It's an easy process. And we're sorry we have to kill those people if they won't move and just give us our resources. But it's nothing personal. It's just good business. That's capitalism. Makes sense. That's unregulated capitalism. But yet, we still have Americans, what, 11, 12 years later, after it's been common knowledge in intelligence agencies all over the world that 9-11 was an inside job totally, that Osama bin Laden had nothing to do with it. We have people that will militantly attack me when they don't have a shred of evidence they haven't read the FBI reports. Our own FBI said for years uh, Osama was never on the wanted list for 9-11. They had no evidence that he was involved. And the Middle Eastern newspapers and Fox News for one day, incidentally, those of you that are naysayers, the Middle Eastern newspapers and Fox News reported the dignitaries that attended Osama's funeral on December 15th of 2001. So Osama's been gone for a decade. We've been living the myth the myth of Osama bin Laden, the myth of terrorists, the drone strikes. Drone strikes in foreign countries are a way to create terrorists, uh, create animosity toward us where there was none. If, if, so, so if we find a, like a country like Angola maybe or some place that has uh, rich resources, we will announce to the world that Al-Qaeda has a base over those resources. We have to send some drone strikes in and kill some people and try to get rid of Al-Qaeda's number two man. And then when they start resisting and fighting back, we send in our military and wipe them out. That's what's going on. We have 5% of the world's people. We spend a trillion dollars a year on the military. And that is eliminating the middle class in America. If we, do, we don't deal with these realities, then the middle class is gone. So the rest of the world, Germany, Australia, a whole bunch of countries are saying, keep the oil. We're going solar, wind power as fast as possible. There's all kinds of beneficial solutions going on that the 5% of people that live in America could adapt to and use to move forward. But we have to face reality. We can't keep running around saying Osama bin Laden attacked us on 9-11. That's a giant crock of bullshit, and I won't tolerate it in my presence anymore. Thank you. Yeah, well, well, it's been interesting stuff, and in particular, there's been a debate of sorts from various folks back and forth about the issue of the extent to which what is happening now is unprecedented or whether that sort of thing is has been as old and as, as, as American as apple pie. Um, and I'm going to start out with a few specific comments about that issue and then go to some broader themes. Ed made the point about how 
in the Great War, you had all sorts of messing around, and not only Ed, another gentleman did too, about messing around with opponents of the war in violation of the what were and, and supposedly still are considered the traditional norms of freedom and so on. The point I would make there is, at least back then, once that war ended, within a few years, that whole atmosphere changed very significantly back to something approaching the pre-war America. Mm -hmm. What we have now is a war in terror which has no conceivable end. So that's one key difference right there. Okay? Um, and so on. This sort of thing likewise happened to a degree after the Second World War. In particular, it happened not so much in the, the late 40s as in the 60s, and it culminated institutionally in the 70s with the church committee's investigations of, among other things, officialdom's persecutions of the anti-war and other movements with outfits like COINTELPRO. So, yes, you've got all sorts of occasions in American history of the ratcheting up of repression but then, once the immediate threat went down the drain, eventually things would get back to something like they had been. Well, I see no reason to believe it's going to happen again. Here you've got an endless war on terror, and the sorts of mechanisms in society which made possible the church <coughs> I just don't see those, see those mechanisms functioning anything like how they did in Senator Church's day. Eugene brought up the whole bit about shotguns and how a generation ago some such CPD didn't go brandishing the things around for the hell of it. Whereas now, you know, you've got all these cops all over the country um, dressed for nuclear war, damn near, yeah. well, uh, to exaggerate it somewhat. We have a very different environment, and you know, I'm tempted to say folks better start facing it. And indeed, I don't think facing it's going to do any good on anything other than a personal level. You know, there's the old Romanian proverb, as I understand, probably goes back centuries, that simply says, "The head that stays bowed doesn't get chopped off," and that's in all likelihood what we're looking at. And the single most significant reason, in my judgment, to account for this change between the days of a guy like Senator Church and now is TV news and punditry. Walter Cronkite would be on for half an hour. If he gave whatever, like the anti-war movement, five minutes in a half hour show, that was a big deal. Now you've got 24-7 news, a number of channels, and then you've got all sorts of pundits recycling on these shows and all over the place. The American people are deluged with news. And they know, therefore, it looks to me, everything except things of importance. In Fred Church's day and before, you had the Mike Roycos of the world, who actually got some backing from the brass when they took on somebody with power. Where oh where are the Mike Roycos now? Or, to be more precise, where oh where are the bosses of the Mike Roycos? Or the would-be Mike Roycos? My guess is they're in the tank themselves. And they're playing ball and they're going along and they're not going to let one of their underlings become a Mike Roico. And everybody in the media establishment, I'll wager, understands this even if they can't face it. And so, and so they all lay low. They all see to it that their heads stay bowed. And so, you know, it's, 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 a, it's a country where we pretend to ask hard questions and pretend to get answers to them. But it's all pretense. And so we may as well just lay low ourselves. Speaker gets the last word. Okay.
Speaker gets the last word. Thank you. Thank you. This was very interesting. I enjoyed the comments. Didn't agree with them all. But so what I'd like to do is just real quickly go through and a few comments that I have mainly on the on these uh, rebuttals. Um, I don't really think I went into a tirade about Israel and Palestine. Um, I mentioned uh, one example, example which a number of people writing on this seem to think is important. I do find it interesting that even one mention of this topic get, you know, kind of uh, gets such a, a, a strong response. Um, basically, um, I did not say, I said in fact at the beginning, I didn't say that this was all new and wasn't different and was, you know, totally different than what had gone before. But what I did indicate was that I thought that there were some significant differences here. I think the point that was made a bit ago is, is, certainly, is certainly one of those uh, that before there were these kind of cyclical ups and downs here and now we, we don't seem to see any reason why it should start getting better. Um, the, I also think that there's the import, there are a couple of other variables important. One is technology. We can do the, the kind of surveillance that can occur now goes way, way, way beyond anything, any sort of surveillance that we've had in the past. That was, that's totally minor league be, compared to what we can do now. And technology, as we all know, tends to be used. That's why one of the big battles now is over freedom on the internet. Because the, inter the internet it does, does offer some real advantages. Um, Another is simply the existence of multi of the power really moving from nation states to multinational corporations. And so that national interests are going to become, you know, less important and this is going to introduce and clearly is now introducing more uniformity uh, around the uh, around the world. I'm glad that um, I, I was interested to hear that taking, wanting to take time off from work is an indication of one potentially one may become a shooter. Um, I, I'm actually loving being retired, so I, I'm liking to take a lot of time off. Um, as for the as far as far as the press, um, yeah, I think the difference. One of the differences now is the incredible concentration of the media the media in this country at least, the popular or standard media has never been nearly as concentrated as, as it is today. On the other hand, I think there's some countervailing forces which are really good, the internet being a very, very important one because this opens, this opens the door. You don't, I mean, having, a, having a, a little amateur website is not the same thing as having the New York Times or the Chicago Trib, but on the other hand, it does give people a chance, and it does. I know in, in a lot of areas, a lot of facts get published about things on smaller on websites, you know, some of which are very, very good. Uh, we have some uh, democracy now is probably the best popular source of news in this country on radio and TV and it's also available on the internet. Um, um, Republicans and Democrats, I would agree, are essentially in areas such as we're talking about here are pretty similar. Um, I actually think that in the long run, Obama can be more of a threat to civil liberties uh, than was Bush, simply because, not because he's, he's any worse, and he's probably somewhat better, but the fact is, but effectively I don't think, I don't think that, you know, that it makes a difference, but effectively people really, it was so easy to hate Bush, and, you know, and, and because uh, uh, politics in this country, tend, this is not this is not a very politically compared to say Western Europe. This is not a politically sophisticated country, and so consequently personalities become even more important. 
and people will say, well, you know, it must be okay. Uh, I agree. Uh, I actually do agree with, uh, and in fact, I thought I had mentioned that, I do agree with Rand Paul on the uh, position he took, and I thought that was really neat. Uh, and I also think that one of the failings of the left in this country has been that they they even, uh, have never been good on single no issues of establishing of establishing alliances mm -hmm. on, on right. particular issues, and they should be supporting. And I've noted that I haven't seen any evidence that they are. They should be supporting him on this. I've done, I mean, I agree, disagree with probably 90 percent of his position, but on this, I think it is, and I think he should be supported. Uh, the issue of the um, uh, someone's talked about uh, looking for the at the ideological roots of of a group. I don't think that we should be looking at the ideological roots because I think law should be concerned with behavior, not belief. And uh, it gets really dangerous when you start putting belief in as a reason for investigating people. That that I don't like. The issue of of uh, occupy. Uh, needing to have a um, leader, um, I think that the reality is that, that uh, Occupy is a very do different kind of organization. Uh, the, uh, the, f the reason people could not come up with a leader wasn't because they were being sneaky. I would suggest it was because people tried as much as possible to make it a non-hierarchical organization so that the question of the leader you know, and I, I happen to think that that's a possibility, obviously. Uh, it's, it's disagreed. And in fact, I think what you really, if you really want to look at Occupy, you have to take kind of a postmodern approach and see it as not only non-hierarchical, but also as, as, as not a permanent organization. One of the reasons, and that, there, there, is, there can be a difficulty there functioning that way, but on the other hand, I think ultimately, I think if there is going to be an answer to this whole thing, it's going to come through different kinds of organizations. And, you know, things like an, the anonymous movement is another example of someone who is doing a very good job of opposing uh, what's going on. And uh, let me just finally say, um, I'm not sure that there is such a thing as a good empire because empire, the main problem with empires are their empires. They try to they try to control other people and other cultures. Thank you very much.